Uh, today we're going to be talking about data structures and the C++ standard library. So we sort of have two main goals in this lecture, um, where one is um, to give you guys a brief introduction to writing code in C++, uh, specifically for competitive programming, because it looks different than like actual C++ that you would write for a class or a job or anything. Um, and this will help a lot with reading the code we have in lectures. Um, so I know like last week we had some code up um, and there were some things that were a little bit confusing to people who hadn't seen them before. So this lecture will sort of help you be able to read our code in the future. And the other goal is um, to learn about all the important built-in data structures in C++ and most other languages that you would use for this. Um, and the, the time complexity of all the operations you can do on them. Okay. Yeah, so first we're gonna talk about um, how to write C++ for competitive programming. So the basic template is gonna look something like this. Um, this include will basically uh, import everything you need for CP. Uh, so you don't need any other includes usually. Um, this is not something that you would ever do uh, outside of this because this is like a huge file to be including. Um, you are never going to be using like all the stuff that's in here. Um, but for CP, it just makes it easier to work with. And uh, sort of same thing here for this using namespace um, STD. Um, basically what that lets you do is if you didn't have this, there's a bunch of like functions and stuff that you would have to put uh, std colon colon before. Um, and this just means you don't have to type that pretty much. Um, but this also isn't something that you would want to use outside of CP um, because you generally want to have this so you can avoid like um, conflicting names and stuff. But yeah, these, these two things are very helpful for CP just for minimizing typing. Um, and then uh, LL is going to be our main integer type. Um, so we're basically never going to use ints. Um, we're always going to use LLs, which we define here as uh, long, long ints. Um, so by adding this type def, we don't have to type out long, long int every time. We can just type LL. Um, and then you have your uh, main function here. Uh, for those of you who have coded in Java before, this is the equivalent of your main method. Um, so this is where most of your code is going to go. All right. So here's sort of what a basic um, program would look like, um, minus all the header stuff we had there. Um, you can make global arrays. That's the way we usually do it. You just make a global array that's bigger than you need it to be. Um, so we usually do plus 10, just in case you have to go like one past the end of the array or something. Um, you can declare a global array like this. Um, just LLA and then the size. Um, and this will automatically be initialized to zero. Um, yeah, so then for input output, um, to Hold read on, something I, in. Uh, just yeah, yeah. you can mention this is that we like to define these uh, uh, macros or the constants up at top for like the size, the input size of the problem. Yeah. Because then you um, use that throughout your code to define like static things. Yeah, because you'll get something that says like, n will be at most 10 to the fifth, right? And then you can just make big N like 10 to the fifth plus 10, and then you're fine. Um, if you guys have any questions at any point, uh, please feel free to stop me. Um, because this is uh, going to be, I guess, a lot more of me talking and a lot less of like problem solving than most of our lectures. Um, so if you have questions, um, it's really important that I sort of get feedback on how um, the presentation's going, because we don't have the problems to sort of gauge that in this lecture. Okay. Yeah, so then uh, for input and output, um, if you want to read in a value, you do C in, um, and then sort of the two arrows going into N, uh, and C out is, uh, if you want to print a value uh, to standard output, um, then you do C out, and then sort of the two arrows going um, out of AI. So, so the way you can think about it is CN is like putting the value into N, right? So you sort of 
direct the arrows into n. And then for c out, you're taking the value out of the variable. Um, so it goes out. Uh, Vingesh had a question. Uh, I, yeah. So I, I, the, the, the basic idea is because it's not Java, like, and not everything has to be in a class. So, uh, so in C++ class stuff, you want to use public and private, but if you're not in a class, then you just don't need that. And since it's not Java, you don't need to have everything in a class. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and yeah, then this just prints a new line. So this is the equivalent of your system that I'll print a line, like empty. Um, yeah, so, so basically all this is going to do is read in a value for n, then read in uh, n integers, and then print them out, pretty much. Uh, so this is like the um, sort of the most basic input-output stuff you could do here. OK. Um, so these, you don't have to really worry too much about what they do. Um, they're just kind of uh, nice things to have. It'll speed up your code. Um, so these are basically going to speed you up in general. I think on code forces, maybe not, because I think code forces might automatically do a bunch of this stuff. I think it does O3 um, automatically, and it does like a stronger version yeah. of O3, but the unroll loops and AVX2, I think, are still... Okay. But yeah, you don't need to worry too much about this. This just makes you faster. And these two lines here are kind of the same thing. Um, this is just going to make input and output faster. This is just a nice thing to throw on your template and not worry too much about. Um, so functions, um, very similar to Java, or um, it's close to Python too, if you've seen those. Um, so you have like the return type and the arguments, um, for, like say return three a plus five. Uh, the one um, thing with functions here that's not true for Java is that if you have a function f calling a function g, um, g has to be above f in the file, uh, so which can get kind of annoying. Well, we'll get to a way to work around that on the next slide. Um, but because of that, you want to keep main below everything else. So that way, when main calls something, it works pretty much. So sometimes Sometimes you can't do this, right? Because like, what if, oh, yeah, what if f needs to call g and g needs to call f? Um, so in that case, you can do something like this, where you just basically declare g above f. Um, any questions? OK. Uh, so data types, um, again, very similar to what you have in a lot of other languages. Um, so we mentioned LLs are going to be our integer type. Um, we're also going to use LDs, which are long doubles. Again, we're doing another type def. So we're making this name LD uh, for long doubles. And we're going to use that as our main floating point type. Right? So you could have LLX equals 5, LDY equals 3.14159. Um, and then you have... Uh, things like Booleans, um, you have strings, characters. Uh, the nice thing about uh, strings here, which we'll get more into later, is if you want to get um, like a certain character within a string, like if you want the fifth character or whatever, uh, you can just index into it like this, uh, like you can in Python. It's not like Java where you have to do the dot char hat. But we'll talk more about strings later. Um, another really nice thing on C++ is you can use pairs. Um, so basically, a pair is you're basically just wrapping up two types into one object, kind of. Um, so for example, here's another type def that we use a lot, where PL represents um, a pair of two LLs. So basically, the syntax here is if you have pair, uh, like type 1, type 2, that represents a pair of an object of type 1 and an object of type 2, um, which you can then access with dot first and dot second. Um, so like if you have some PLA, which so a pair of two LLs A, you can then read in a dot first and a dot second, like you would any other LL variable. Um, and you can put basically any types in this pair. 
right? So you can make a pair of a char and a bool um, and have something like this. Uh, and you can even have nested pairs. So like a pair of an LL and a pair. Um, and you can keep nesting this for however many levels you need. Right. So if, like for this one, um, the dot first is six and the dot second is A, which as we showed up here is a pair. Uh, Vinesh had another question. Yeah. Um, oh yeah, type def. Um, so type def is basically letting you rename a type. Um, so basically what this will do is um, anytime you type LL, um, it will interpret that as long, long int. So we're basically just doing this. We don't have to type out long, long int every time. You can get away with just typing two characters. And it's the same thing here. This is so we don't have to type out pair LL, LL every time. We can just type PL. And it'll do the same thing. Um, Keith can probably talk more about that. Yeah. It's kind so of close. A, a hashtag really. define is like a is sort of in a on a lower level. It's a, it's called a macro. The hashtag defines, and they they happen before the code is even compiled. It's called the preprocessor, and it basically does like a string replacement, like a find and replace. Um, so that can kind of get annoying uh, if uh, if you're for ver as you can kind of guess um, in weird circumstances you don't want a string and replace. You want like certain tokens to be understood in different ways. So a type def happens on the compiler level. So it actually like, understands the code and go, it goes ahead and replaces the types with the correct ones. Yeah, so uh, the, the pair data structure is, um, it's basically just you have one object of the first type and another object of the second type, um, and they're part of the same variable. Um, so you can access them with like dot first and dot second, and you can modify dot first and dot second independently. Um, but it's like one unit, kind of. it's one variable. Yes, exactly. So c.second.second is equal to a.second here, because notice that c.second is a, right? So you have like a pair of pairs here. So c.second is a pair, which is a, and then a.second is whatever value we read in here. So the pair sort of just lets you wrap two types in one variable. That's what that's kind of doing. Any other questions on this? It's very useful because you can put the pairs in arrays, you can compare the pairs, you can, do all, you can check for quality, yeah. you can do all sorts of things with pairs. It's just built-in functions. Yeah, I know when I was using Java for CP, uh, I wrote so many pair classes um, because there's a lot of times you need to like be able to compare a pair of objects um, or like sort them or something and not having that in Java was very annoying. So having this is nice. Okay. Um, yeah, so the next thing we're gonna talk about is sorting. Um, so this is really nice because let's say you have an array of LLs. Um, if you wanna sort that- Hold on, maybe like one question. Oh, uh, one more question? Maybe. Yeah, if you want a Java alternative to pairs, you basically have to make a class yourself. Um, yeah. So yeah, so if you want to sort, um, say the first n elements of an array, you can do that by just doing sort a comma a plus n. Um, and this will also work for any type that's comparable. Um, so you can sort an array of chars, um, an array of strings. Strings, um, anything that's comparable, you can sort like this. And importantly, one thing you can sort like that is pairs. Um, so the comparator for a pair is it's going to check first if, um, like if you're comparing two pairs, A and B, it's first going to check their dot first values, right? So like if you're comparing these two pairs, um, you first look at the first values. So three is less than four here. So that means this pair is less. But if these values are equal, then you're going to compare by this, the dot seconds. So in this case, the dot first are equal, but the dot second is less. Um, so this one is less. And this is very useful because it basically lets you sort by multiple, I guess, levels, right? Because let's say you want to sort, um, what's a good example for this? If 
you want to sort first by like the value and then second by like the index. Um, then the, the pair comparator will just do that for you. Um, and this is one of the most common times you would use pairs is when you need to be able to uh, sort these objects that sort of have two values associated with them, um, but you need to keep them together. You can't like sort the list separately. Um, does that make sense? Basically what the pair sorting is, is you're like prioritizing the dot first. Um, so if the dot first is less, then uh, it's less. Otherwise, if it's equal, if you can't make a decision based on the dot first, then you use the dot second. Okay. Oh, what the hell? Okay, yeah. So um, another nice thing is macros, which we briefly talked about before um, with the n, uh, where you have array size plus 10 or whatever. Um, but you can also add some more complicated macros. Um, so one thing I like to use is this gx macro, um, which takes in a parameter x and will then create an LLX and read it in from CN. So if you have GN here, this is um, equivalent to having LLN, CNN. And that's because this is what Akif was talking about before with the string replacement. So before you compile, um, it's going to go through all of your code here and find anything that matches the pattern like GX and automatically do like text replacement and turn that into LL and CNN. Um, and then you can also have something like this where you have a shortened for loop, right? So FILR um, goes from I from L to uh, R minus one um, and then increments it. Uh, so you can do something like this, where for i from 0 to n, you read in these values. Um, and then another one I like to use is k and v for first and second. Um, that's really just saving a few characters for each one. Uh, but if you are working with pairs a lot, that can save you a lot. Notice one thing here is that uh, because it's text replacement, you have to be very careful. So he, he just parentheses around the r there. Uh, because otherwise you could have things that mess with like operator precedence and then just like have a completely different meaning because it's text yeah. displacement and not an actual function. So they can yeah. be kind of annoying to use, but if you use them correctly, oh, you have a whole slide on this. Yeah. Nice. Okay. So um, with, with macros, you have to be careful about how you do parentheses. Because um, let's say you make this SQ macro to square a number. Um, if you try to write it like this, and then you try to print SQ three plus five, um, that's going to expand out to this, right? Because all it's doing is text replacement. So it's taking the X here and it's turning that into three plus five. And it's taking this X here, it's turning that into three plus five. So if you um, evaluate this with order of operations, this goes to 23, right? Which is not what you want because you want 64 here. So to prevent this, um, it's usually a good idea to put parentheses around all your macro arguments instead here. So if you have the parentheses here, now when you do the replacement, um, you get the answer you want because you have the parentheses to enforce the order of operations. Uh, syntax rules you can have for semicolons. semicolons. You can have semicolons and macros and it's yeah. fine. Embrace it and everything. It, it literally happens before the compiler even runs. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so you can put whatever you want here because it's just doing like, a string replacement, like we said. So as long as the string works where it would be in the code, um, you're OK. There's some very clever things you can do with this. With, uh, with yeah. And it's, it gets very like, yeah. kind of insane and not good code practice, but like it's cool. Oh, yeah. I mean, a lot of these things, most of these things, you wouldn't do in any real situation, like uh, the for loop macro or really any of these things. Uh, but this is just, it saves you a lot of time when you're doing stuff for CP. Any other questions on this? OK. All right, so now we're going to talk about uh, the built-in data structures you have in C++. Um, and there's equivalent.
equivalents of these in most of the languages you'd use. Um, but Java has equivalents for everything. I think Python is missing a set, but we'll, no, we we have most, we have set, but it's it's called set, but it it's doesn't it's not sorted. So yeah, okay. But yeah, we're gonna talk about it specifically uh, in relation to C plus plus though. Okay. So first, uh, we're going to talk about vectors. So for those of you who've seen Java, uh, this is basically an array list. Um, so essentially, it is an array where you can change the size and like add and remove from the back and that kind of stuff. Um, so the sort of important operations you have, there are more things you can do. Um, but sort of the important operations you're going to do a lot are um, add and, oh, uh, before we talk about that, to initialize it, all you have to do is type this. Um, and then that will create an empty vector for you. Um, and then once you have that, you can use push back to uh, initialize, to add values to it. Um, there are ways to initialize a vector like with a constructor. Um, I, I don't know, I, I think that's not super important when you're doing CP because you can usually just do pushbacks. But if you guys are interested in that, you can into it. Um, but yeah, the pushback will add an element to the back of the vector. Um, pop back will remove an element from the back of the vector. Uh, and then like an array, you can access VI. Um, oh, someone has a hand up. Hand up. It wasn't Adam. Are these, are these like similar to lists in Java? Yeah, it's okay. like an array list. Yeah. So you basically have all those operations here. Um, yeah, so then uh, like a, an array. Oh, ben, um, ben had another question. Oh, another one. Um, so this is again, C++ is not Java, is sort of the yeah, answer here. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, that, so null in C++ is only for pointers, but uh, when you're making this V here, we're not making a pointer, we're just declaring this space for this object v and saying there is a vector here um, and that vector is yeah. just default initialized to whatever default vector is yeah um, so yeah you can uh access or modify the element at position i in constant time uh, just like with an array so you can like set vi to be 10 you can print out vi do whatever you want um, you can also sort it in n log n, just like an array. Uh, you want to do sort v dot begin v dot end. We're going to talk a lot more about what begin and end are uh, toward the end of the lecture. Uh, but this is just how you do that. Um, you can get the size of the vector in constant time, so the number of elements. Um, and then to iterate over all the elements, you can just use this enhanced for loop, which is very nice. You don't have to worry about iterators or anything like that. Or even you don't have to iterate over just the indices. Um, you can just do this and it'll iterate over everything. Another question uh, from Max. Uh, They're generally about the same, I think. So you get like a factor of two from the array list like thing from adding and appending, but like but for yeah. the actual access and use there should be the same speed. And yeah, so vectors things... versus arrays are much more a matter of like uh, personal preference or like the specific case you're using them for, or they're more or less interchangeable, kind of. Um, oh yeah, so the the slash n prints a new line, um, so that's the equivalent of like print ln in Java with like an empty argument. It's just printing out another line. Okay, any questions on vectors? Okay. So strings in C++ are basically vectors. Um, you get a lot of the same operations. Um, they do have a few more things you can do. Um, so one thing is you can set a string like directly equal to a string literal. So you can say like string s equals like abc or whatever, um, which is a different syntax than vectors have. But um, and there's a couple other additional things, but mostly 
you can treat them the same way as vectors. So you can do pushback, you can pop back, um, you can access elements, you can get the size, iterate over all the characters in it. Um, but so the other uh, important operations you have in addition to that are if you want to add another string to the back, um, you can do that in O of t dot size. So if this operation only takes O of t dot size, as opposed to Java, where if you did this, it would take O of s dot size plus t dot size. So that can save you in some cases where you want to add like a bunch of small strings to the end of a big string. This will save you a huge amount of time on that. Um, also, maybe then, something I, yeah. I should mention just on strings is that if you're trying to use them in a C function, like a C function that you, takes in a string, to get a C string out of it, you have to do dot data. And that gives you the equivalent of a C string. C strings aren't something that you work with that much um, in CP. So if you're not sure like what the difference there is, don't you don't really have to worry about that. Um, and then also you can print the string, which will take all of them. Yeah, so they're, they're essentially just vectors that you have some additional nice operations on top of. All right, so sets are um, self-balancing binary search trees. Uh, so they're implemented as red black trees, which uh, for those of you who've already taken data structures, um, it's kind of the same idea as an AVL tree. Um, so the nice thing is you don't have to actually implement them because they're built in uh, to C++. Um, and you can just use all those operations for free. It's not like data structures where you have to like, write out all those horrible insert case, cases and stuff. Um, and yeah, so this is the same as tree set in Java, for those of you who've seen that. And basically what this does is it stores a bunch of distinct values. So you can't store duplicates here, um, but you get some really nice complexities for a bunch of operations. Um, oh, under the condition that the type here has to be comparable. So it has to have some built-in comparison function, which most things that you would want to do this with do. So uh, LLs you can use, you can use PLs because they have a comparator built in. You can use strings, uh, characters, but basically most things you would use are fine. Um, and then the operations you have in terms of n, the size of the set. So you can insert an element in log n time. Um, if it's already in the set, that won't do anything, right? Because it doesn't store duplicates. Uh, but it'll make sure that it's in the set afterwards. Um, you can remove an element in log n. Uh, you can determine if an element is present in log n. So these three operations are really uh, the three main ones you're going to be using a lot. Because what sets are used for often is um, you want to be able to determine which elements are in your set quickly and also be able to insert and erase from them quickly. So these three are important, and they all happen in log n, um, which if you tried to do this on a vector, these would all be, well, the insert would be constant time, but the remove and the dot count would be linear time. Uh, you can also get the min and the max element in log n time by uh, using s.begin and s.r begin. Uh, again, we're going to talk more about what these mean later, but this is another nice operation you have. And then you can also get the size of the set in O1, and once again, iterate over all the elements in ON. And this time, this is going to iterate over them in sorted order, which is nice. So we'll go through from smallest to biggest. Any questions on sets? One thing is that people don't realize just how many things are comparable. So in, on top of the things that Joe mentioned, even the things like vectors or even sets themselves, I think, are probably comparable. Um, and they use the same sort of uh, priority sorting that Joe mentioned. Yeah. So most of the time, you can put whatever in here. There's some like weird structs and stuff you can come up with that won't work. But 
mostly. It's good. Okay. So one other thing on sets is sometimes you, you want to be able to have duplicate values in your set, right? Because like, let's say you do want to store multiple copies of an element, um, but the set by default isn't going to do that. So there's two main ways that we usually get around this. Um, so the first way is you can use a multi-set, uh, which is probably the easier way to do it in most cases. Um, a multi-set is basically the same as a set in basically every way, except it stores duplicates. Um, and also you have to be careful that if you do dot erase x, uh, that will erase all copies of x. So if you want to erase just one, you can uh, do erase dot find x. Um, yeah, so that's one way you can do it. The other thing you can do is use a set of pairs where you have some other value attached to it that makes it unique. So for example, if you want to store all the values in an array A in a set and keep duplicates, one way you can do that is instead of having a set of LLs and inserting AI, you can have a set of PLs and insert AI comma I. And notice that that's also not going to mess up your sorting, right? Because the pair sorting is going to sort first by AI and then by I. So it's only going to really compare the I's when the AI's are equal. So you still have your nice sorting order for the AI, but you also have the I's here to sort of allow you to store duplicates, right? Because every value is going to have a different I. Does this make sense? Okay. Yeah, so you can really use either of these solutions. I think they're generally like equally good. I think we tend to use the second one more, um, but they both work. Okay. Yeah, so then uh, we're gonna talk about maps. So maps are kind of like a set where every value in the set has an attached value. Um, so you have sort of a set of keys and each key is associated with a value. Um, and this is basically a tree map in Java, if you guys have seen that. Um, and it sort of gives you the same functionality as you would get in a hash map. Although we'll talk about why using like an actual hash map is usually not a good idea in CP. Um, yeah, so basically um, you have a lot of kind of the same operations as you would have for a set. Um, so you can erase a key, you can determine if a key is in the set. Um, and then in place of inserting a key into a set, you can associate a key with a value, which you can do like this. So even if five isn't already in the set, you can do this and it will associate the key five with the value seven. And you can also do something like this where you can increment the value of or you can increment the value associated with three. So it's basically a set where every element or every key in the set is associated with some value. Um, and then, yeah, similar to a set, you can get the min and the max keys by doing this. Um, notice that the map is kind of, um, not exactly, but it's kind of a set of PLs in this case. Um, so you can use dot k and dot v, which are the macros we had before for dot first and dot second. Um, so you can print out like the dot first of the dot begin, which is your first element, and that'll give you the smallest key. And you can print out the dot first of your biggest element, and that'll give you your biggest key. And you can kind of see that structure better here, where we're talking about how to iterate over all the pairs. Um, because you can see that this type we're iterating over is just a pair of LL LLs. Right? So the map is kind of a list of these pairs where you're guaranteed that the dot firsts are all unique. Any questions on this?
Okay. Yeah, so I would talk on. one thing. Oh, oh, yeah. With the plus plus mm -hmm. thing, uh, if it's not there, it gets initialized to zero when you do that. So if you try to, yes. if you try to either read or modify a value that you haven't made before, it gets initialized to zero or whatever yeah. the default value is for that type. Yeah, so in this case, if three wasn't in the map before, if it wasn't in the set of keys, this would set M3 to one. Because when you access it, if it's not there, it assumes it's zero and it sets it to zero. Um, and then you increment it so it goes to one. Yeah, so all the stuff with dot begin and dot r begin, uh, we're going to talk a lot about later. Um, so for now, you can just assume that the dot begin and r begin is giving you like the, the smallest and biggest. But we're going to talk a lot more about iterators later. Okay. Yeah, so I talked a little bit before about you don't want to use a hash map or a hash set. Um, so C++ has unordered set and unordered map as built-in types, which are the equivalent of like hash set and hash map in Java. And they reduce the cost of all the like insert, remove, find operations to constant time in theory, like overall, if you do a lot of operations. Um, but the problem is there are test cases that can make the size of your set or your map blow up and make all your operations much slower. And um, a lot of times these will be built into the test cases of a problem, specifically to mess with people who are using unordered set or unordered map. And even and if also built in, then other people yeah. can hack them. The exactly. Yeah. Um, so it's usually not a good idea to use these um, because the extra log factor for a uh, normal set or map doesn't really matter anyway. And those aren't going to be susceptible to any of these kinds of test cases. So yeah, in general, just avoid these. Uh, a blood a question. Um, oh, for this, um, I think what happens is um, you insert a lot of things that hash to the same location. And then if you insert enough things that hash to that location, the uh, hash table will like double in size. And then you can do that again and insert a bunch of things that hash to the same location and it'll double in size again. And you can keep doing that. And after a few steps, the size of the hash table is so big um, that- I don't think that's exactly correct. I think the, that, I thought it was that when you hash the same location enough, if you've ON things in the same bucket, then when you go to read from that bucket, oh, each operation takes it, read or add to that bucket. Does it not double? I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, I think you keep right. the load factor, but I don't think that matters. I think the part that matters is that all the operations take linear time then. Yeah. Some implementations of the hash table are just using the length list, so there's no doubling. Um, okay, yeah, that, so that could, also, that could be it. Uh, but basically the problem is you're getting a bunch of stuff that hash to the same place. Um, and then there's no nice way for the hash table to deal with that. Okay. Yeah, so now we're going to talk a lot about iterators. So we've seen uh, these a few places before. Um, they're kind of similar to pointers in C, kind of. Um, basically, they point to a given location in the data structure. Um, so there's kind of two types that show up a lot. This first type, I don't know if it's really an iterator, but it kind of is, um, is when you want to deal with an array. Um, so like when we had sort A, A plus N, this is referring to um, basically the points in memory that you want to sort. Uh, so, so you want to sort the range from A to A plus N. So, so with that, there's like a combination of two things. So first is that arrays will yeah. decay to pointers. And the second part is that pointers are like a special type of random access iterator. So that's what's happening yeah. there. Yeah, so for arrays, you're going to basically work with like A and A plus N usually. Um, and then for vectors or sets or maps, um, you're going to work with dot begin and dot end, which kind of give you the same thing, which we'll talk about on the next slide. Um, and there's a lot of really useful built-in functions that will take in an iterator range as a parameter um, and then give you some result based on that. Um, and you can also use them for finding a specific element of the data structure, like dot begin will give you the first one. So basically the way dot begin, dot end, r begin, and r end work um, 
is if you have v is some vector set or map, uh, dot begin points to the first element of v, uh, and then dot end points to one after the last element of v. Um, and then r begin is going to basically be the opposite. So that's basically if you reverse the vector, what would the dot begin dot end be? So r begin points to the last element, and r end points to one before um, the first element. And so these sort of give you two iterator ranges, which are always going to be half open. So like v.begin to v.end is an iterator range where you want to include v.begin, but not include v.end. Right? So you're starting at v.begin, and you're going up to the one before v.end to sort of define the range of this vector. And you can do the same thing from rbegin to rend, except it'll basically be counting backwards. Wait, I have a question. Yeah. Could you go from v begin to r begin? I don't think so. I think reverse iterators are like their own type. Uh, Keith, can you confirm that? Uh, I don't know if 100% what exactly what will happen, but I think, yeah, they're not really compatible. I want to try it. Yeah. Oh, give me a minute. Yeah, reverse iterators are weird. Like, what's there's something that you can't do with reverse iterators. That... Oh yeah, you can't like, delete from them or something, right? Also, can't go backwards. You, you can't like pass it to delete in, in for sets. You can't. Yeah, delete. that's what it is. Yeah. Yeah. You can't really generally do things using both of these. You have to kind of stick with one set or the other. E either dot begin dot end or dot r begin dot r end. Uh. Yeah, so dereferencing iterators. So this is the um, star operator that we had before on a couple of the other slides. Basically, what star does is it um, converts the iterator, which is basically pointing to the location of the value, and it turns it into the actual value. Right. So v dot begin is basically just pointing to this location. But then if you do star v dot begin, that will give you the actual value that's stored here. So if you print star v dot begin, that'll print the first element of v, which for a vector is basically the equivalent of printing v0. For a set or a map, you can't do this. So you have to sort of print it like this. Uh, but this is sort of how you can think about it for a vector. OK, yeah, you, you can't compare forward or inverse iterators. Oh, sense. but what you can do is you can uh, dereference the iterator and then get the address, and then you can compare those. <laughs> nice. OK. Yeah, so another uh, important thing you can do with iterators is increment or decrement them. So you can do plus plus or minus minus. Um, the one thing to make sure here is that you stay in bounds of the data structure. Um, because, for example, you don't want to go past like v dot end, because then you're going to get like weird undefined behavior. Um, but as long as you stay within this range and you put whatever if statements you need to check that that's okay, um, you can do plus plus or minus minus, and it'll move the iterators one step along. So, for example, if you do this, um, it will print the second element in the vector, right? Because you take the iterator to the first element, and then increment it. So now it's pointing at the second element. And then you dereference it, so it prints the value at the second position. Um, again, assuming that the size is at least 2. Because if the size of the vector is less than 2, then you get like weird undefined behavior here. Um, and then you can also do stuff like this. You can declare uh, an iterator as like a variable. You can just use auto, which will uh, automatically detect the type of v.begin um, and make a variable it of that type. Because the type name for this is like super long. Um, so you usually don't want to type that out. Um, and then you can increment it five times. And then if you print the value there, that'll be the sixth element in the vector, right? Because you incremented it five times. Um, one thing to notice is that if you increment or decrement a reverse iterator, that'll go backwards. 
So if you increment a reverse iterator, it will go further to the left. Um, and if you decrement it, it'll go to the right. So it's like the opposite direction as a, as a forward iterator. It makes sense. Okay, questions on this? Yeah, so there's a whole bunch of built-in functions that take in an iterator range and do something useful. So one we saw before is sorting, where you just give it the first, you give it the dot begin dot end, um, and it'll sort that range. You can also do maximum element in a range. Um, so notice that this returns an iterator. So if you want the actual maximum value, you have to dereference it. Right, because this will give you basically a pointer to the maximum value. But if you want the actual maximum value, you dereference it with the star. Uh, there's also a min element that does the same thing, but for minimum. Um, accumulate will return the sum of elements in a range um, plus whatever this value is. But usually you just want to add zero to the sum of the stuff in the range. Um, you can also fill a range with a value x using either fill or fill n. Um, you can copy one range to another using either copy or copy n. Um, IOTA is one that we use in a few cases where you want to set AI equal I for all I in that range. This just saves you from writing a for loop pretty much. And then you can also reverse a range, um, which again saves you from writing a for loop. And so I wrote all of these with the um, array set up here. So like a, a plus n, you could do any of these with a vector. So with v dot begin, v dot end. Um, you wouldn't do any of these with a set or a map because it doesn't really make sense for a lot of them. Um, like you can't reverse a set because it's always going to be in sorted order. Um, but you could do any of these for like an array or a vector. Questions on any of these? Okay. Yeah, so we have a nice macro we like to use for uh, this, which is the A macro, which basically just takes in V, which can be either like a vector, a set, or a map, and it'll return V.begin, V.end. And this basically just lets you write this instead of writing this, which can save you a lot of code. So for the rest of the lecture, we're going to have this up a lot. Uh, this is basically just dot begin dot end. OK. So vector iterators are nice because in addition to the like increment decrement that we had before, you can also subtract any two of them to sort of get the distance between them. Um, so one really nice use case you can use this for is to convert an iterator to an index, like to i, like from zero up to n or whatever. So let's say uh, it is an iterator pointing to vi. Then it minus v.begin will print i, right? Because let's say it is v.begin, then um, it's point then uh, v dot begin minus v dot begin is zero, right? Because it's like zero steps ahead of v dot begin, so you're at index zero. Whereas if you're looking at like v four or whatever, it's sort of four steps ahead of v dot begin, so it'll print four. You can also because it's random access, you can also add like no numbers to it. So yeah. You can start with v dot begin plus five, and that'll give you a pointer to v five. Right. Yeah, so you can do any like nice addition subtraction you want to do to um, manipulate them forward or backward by an arbitrary amount. And that lets, oh, yeah. Um, another useful thing you can do for vectors or arrays is um, you have upper bound and lower bound, which basically you have to first sort the vector or the array. And then um, upper bound of 
like v.begin, v.end, comma, x, will give you an iterator to the first element in v that's strictly bigger than x. Um, and it will do this in log n time by doing a binary search on the vector, which is why your vector has to be sorted first. Um, and if there is no element bigger than x in the array, it'll return v.end, right? Because v.end is past the end of the array. So that sort of indicates invalid. And it, you can also think about it as the first element bigger than x, because you can kind of assume that there's some really big element at the end of your sorted vector. Um, but yeah, if you're using upper bound, you usually want to check if it equals v.end to sort of handle that case. Yeah, so it'll do it in log n because it binary searches. And then lower bound does the same thing, except it finds the first element that's greater than or equal to x. So lower bound can be equal to x. Upper bound has to be greater than x. And so now, once you have these functions, you can do a few really nice things. Um, so one kind of obvious thing you can do is if you want to print the first element greater than x in v, um, again, first you want to check edge cases, like you're not going out of bounds. Um, but you can just print out dereferenced upper bound, right? Because upper bound gives you the iterator to the first element greater than x, then dereference it, that gives you the actual value. Um, and then also you can increment or decrement these uh, iterators. So if you want to print the first element less than x, the way you can do that is, so like, let's say you want to find the first element less than four here. The way you do that is you find the first element greater than or equal to four, which is this, which is your lower bound. Then you go back one position and that's your first element less than x. Um, oh, this should be, sorry, this should be the last element less than x. Um, and then if you want to find the last element less than or equal to x, you can do the same thing, but with upper bound, right? Because this is the first element greater than x. So go to the left by one and that's the first element less than or equal to x, the last element less than or equal to x. And then another nice trick you have is if you want to print the number of occurrences of x, you can do upper bound minus lower bound. So if you look here, the lower bound of four is this position, because this is the first position less than or equal to four, greater than or equal to four. And upper bound is here, because this is the first position um, greater than four. So if you subtract this iterator from this iterator, you get a distance of four between them, right? And that indicates that you have four copies of four in your vector. The, the way I like to think about upper bound and lower bound is sort of related to this, is that uh, they give a half open range, like normal iterator range, of all the equal values to four. So if you have, so it literally yeah, the type nice. of range you pass into like the, all the other functions, same thing here, just with all the ones that are four. Yeah. It took me about a year to remember upper bound is the bigger one. Um, yeah, it took me like a year to figure out how to use these. Yeah. I would it like to forget out, every time. The easy way to remember is that upper is bigger because it's like, it's upper. Wow. <laughs> Crazy. Quote yourself. Yeah, that legitimately would have saved me like a year. Um, oh, notice that this also works if there are no occurrences of x in v. Because like, let's say x is 5. Then the upper bound and lower bound will both be here. And so if you subtract them, you just get 0 because they're the same. Or even if x is like 10, they're both going to be dot end. But that's fine when you subtract them because they're the same, and it'll become 0. So this, you don't have to check edge cases for. OK. Oh, so one last thing. With the uh, second bullet point, you also have to check edge cases there, but it's the opposite. You check if it's not dot begin before you yeah. do the subtraction. Yeah. OK. Yeah, so set and map iterators are going to be similar to vector iterators, except you can't do this like arbitrary addition and subtraction that we were doing before, because they're not random access iterators. Um, you can increment them by one or decrement them by one, but that's really all you can do with them for the most part. Um, and you still have dot begin, dot r begin, 
dot end dot r end. So you can still use all of that. You just can't do any of like this subtracting two iterators or something like that. So what this means is that upper bound and lower bound are going to be a little bit different for sets and maps. Um, so s dot upper bound will give you an iterator to the first element greater than x. Um, notice that we're using s dot upper bound and not upper bound a s. Um, it's like a separate function that's defined for sets. Um, and yeah, lower bound is again the same thing. So that's again can give you an iterator to the first element greater than or equal to x. So these work basically the same as upper bound and lower bound vectors. Um, but again, you can't do the subtraction trick we had before because you can only go up or down by one position at a time. Any questions on this? All right. Yeah, so thank you guys for coming. Um, as always, these slides are in the info channel on Discord, um, and we'll have recording up soon. Uh, there's a contest running on our Code Forces group right now with problems that kind of use these concepts. So unlike most of our lectures, this isn't really like one concept. Um, but we, I tried to put up problems that sort of use the idea of vectors and sets and stuff like that. Um, yeah, so that contest will be running for the next week. Uh, so I encourage you guys to take a look there. Uh, go over the problems. It's very good practice um, if you want to start out using C++. Um, so yeah. Oh, and also importantly, um, next week is our first practice contest. Um, so it's going to be running from 7 to 9 p.m. instead of our usual 8 to 9 p.m. Um, because we want to be able to get in like a full two-hour code forces round. Um, we will have information about the location posted soon in the next couple of days. Um, this is, we are going to be in person somewhere. Uh, we don't know exactly where that's going to be yet, um, but we're also going to have the option to join virtually for anyone who can't make it uh, in person. What day is it going to be? Yeah, so it's going to be Thursday. Okay. Um, okay. So in place of the lecture, okay. but starting an hour earlier. All right. And we're going to have everyone grouped up with a mentor to solve the problems. Um, yeah. Uh, Bush campus. We're very high likelihood it's going to be on Bush campus. Even if you can't show up for the whole thing because it's earlier, like still show up for the second half weekend or whatever. Because yeah. Yeah. No. Even if you can only come for like a half hour block or something, this isn't going to be like if you miss, you can miss any amount of this and sort of jump in or out anywhere. Um, it's not going to be as structured as a lecture. Um, so e even if you can only make it for part, I really encourage you guys to come because this would be a great way to get better at this kind of problem solving. So yeah, I hope to see you guys there.